Well, hello, and welcome to session two of our Lenten Bible study. Uh, this is the study that uh, we are basing on the book by Adam Hamilton, uh, Words of Life, and it's a marvelous uh, delving into the commandments, the Ten Commandments, but more importantly, how Jesus brought those commandments to life for um, everyday living. And so today, we're going to be studying Commandment 3 and 4. The uh, session for 3 is um, to look at these particular goals, if, if you can see those. We want to consider what the third commandment has to say about our words and our actions, and then to reflect on what it means to be a disciple of Christ in those words and actions. So hopefully by the end of our time together, you'll be more comfortable with that, okay? Now, the biblical foundation for this commandment is Exodus 20, verse 7, Numbers, chapter 30, verse 2, Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16, Matthew, chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. The third commandment is recorded in Exodus 20, verse 7, and it states, do not use the Lord your God's name as if it were of no significance. The Lord won't forgive anyone who uses his name that way. Now, I suspect if you're like I am, you grew up um, reading the Ten Commandments or hearing them, and you heard it stated just a little bit differently than that. And that's partly what we're going to be talking about. So let's begin our time together with a word of prayer. If you will bow with me. Heavenly Father, Meet us today as we dive deeper into your commandments and learn more about the truths your word has for us. Open our hearts that we might draw closer to you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, now, which will be our norm, we're going to join Adam Hamilton, our author, as he shares his thoughts on this commandment and will also be in conversation with his friend, the rabbi. You may have wondered where the studio is that we've set up for this video. And I want to tell you just a little bit about that. But before I do, I want to remind you that there is some debate about when Moses actually lived. Did he live in the 1400s BC and did the Exodus occur in the mid 1400s BC? Or did he live in the 1300s and the 1200s and the Exodus occurred around 1280 BC? Most mainline scholars believe the latter, that Moses lived in the 1300s, the 1200s, the Exodus occurred around 1279 BC or somewhere around that period of time. And during that time, a man named Ramses II was pharaoh in Egypt. Now, this is an exhibit, the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, a traveling exhibit from Turin, Italy. And this is an exhibit of Ramses II's wife's tomb and the things that were found in her tomb. And so we are looking at the cover of the sarcophagus, the lid of the sarcophagus, for the wife of the Pharaoh, when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt and to the Promised Land. I'm really excited to have a friend of mine, the director and CEO of the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. He's responsible for this beautiful exhibit that's here, and he's going to be sharing with us a little bit about it, Julian Sukasagoitia. Julian, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for being here, and welcome to the Nelson Atkins. Thanks. So tell us, we, we've seen bits and pieces of this so far. Tell us what we're seeing here. So here we are really in the reconstruction of the chamber, the burial chamber of Nefertari. And uh, this is part of the big exhibition that we brought to Kansas City, rendering homage to one of the greatest queens of ancient times. She's the beloved wife of Ramses II. And this tomb, and you see here some of the replicas of the bas reliefs that are painted, is considered to be like the 16th chapel of Egyptian tombs, the most beautiful and the best preserved one that has been found in antiquities. And she's buried in the Valley of the Kings or the Valley of the Queens? She's buried in the Valley of the Queens, and so on the west side of the Nile. And uh, that tomb, as long as many of the uh, Valley of the Queens tombs were discovered in the early 1900s by an Italian delegation led by uh, an archaeologist called Schiaparelli. And, and this exhibit is on loan from Turin, is that correct? Exactly. This, this, of course, all the materials, and at the time, the Italian government, well, they gave permits to 
foreigners, they shared the discoveries of the tomb, and so all of this is normally housed in the Turin Museum of Egyptian Art. And you've created this to scale, is that correct? So this is one-on-one, -on -one, and here you have, for instance, the sarcophagus, the lead of the sarcophagus. This is pink granite, and you see it's a very hard stone, but the violence in antiquity to rob tombs, because they had treasures, of course, but also because they were trying also sometimes to obliterate the possibility of the spirit to continue living in, in, in this people. So you see the violence of this very, and very few things were left in the tomb. The tomb in antiquities was robbed already, and very few objects remain. Today we come to the third commandment, and as we do, we remember these words, do not use the name of the Lord your God as though it were of no significance. Now often we just hear that as don't cuss, don't swear. And of course this commandment would have some bearing on that, especially when we swear using God's name. When we say God's name or we say the word God and we don't mean anything by it or we use it as an exclamation, something we're angry about or upset about, we're misusing the idea, the very idea and the very name or the word we use for God. But of course the commandment had a lot more to say than just you know, asking us not to speak in these ways using the name of God. It did, as you'll discover as you're reading the text, it did have something to do with the promises that we make. And so, you know, we sometimes say, I've heard people say, I swear to God. And usually that's a way of saying, I'm telling the truth, I'm telling the truth. But what happens if you swear in God's name and you're not telling the truth? We're going to explore that just a little bit today. And then, of course, there are ways that we talk about God, things that we say about God or we attribute to God that are not consistent with the character of God. So I remember a woman I spoke to some years ago, and, and she had uh, come to the church for the very first time, and I said, well, you know, I'm so glad you're here, tell me your story, and she said, well, I haven't been to church in a long time. I stopped going to church after my child died, and people told me it was the will of God. So when we attribute to God something like the death of a child, that God took this woman's child, and we say that that was God's will, God did that, we're saying something about God that may be inconsistent with the character of God and actually pushes people away from God. We can give God a bad name. Of course, in the end, what I'm going to suggest to you is that, is that our very lives, how we live as Christians, as people of faith, how we live our lives is meant to be a way of not just not dishonoring God or misusing God's name or using God's name as, as if it's of no significance, but instead that we are meant to live our lives in such a way that we give God a good name, that, that when people look at us and they know that we're Christians, they see a picture, a representation of the God who is, who gives us life, who loves us. And so I'm going to encourage and challenge you as we explore this commandment to be ready to ask, am I a good representation of the name of God? Am I bearing God's name well? Let's talk about God's name and the command, do not use the Lord your God's name as if it were of no significance. First of all, how is that normally uh, translated into English uh, in the Tanakh? Do not take God's name in vain. Yeah. So that's classical. That's what most of us memorized when we were growing up. So what does that mean? Well, I think most people think that it means you don't, you don't curse using God's name. And I'd say that's correct, but I think it's much more than that. I believe when we, when we do things in life in God's name that, is not, that are not holy, that is taking God's name in vain. That is taking God's name as though it is of no significance to use your translation. I think too often we act and speak in God's name when in fact we're speaking on our behalf and we're using the power of God, that intimate relationship with God in order to elevate ourselves. I believe that's when it becomes a sin, if you would. Um, let's talk about, for a moment, the commandment also states that when we violate this commandment, God punishes to the fourth generation, uh, something some call transgenerational uh, retribution. What do you do with that? I struggle with it. I struggle with it because I don't want to believe that things that I do, my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren will suffer as a result of that. However, there's a truth to it. Mm -hmm. We are in the midst of destroying our planet through climate change that is human-based. There's no question in my mind that our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren will suffer as a result of what we've done. When we act in ways that cause irreparable damage to relationships, to the world, to communities, I do believe that, that those who come after us 
in fact suffer and suffer the the pain of of knowing that we've created those those problems in the world. So I think that it does happen, but I struggle with the idea that they have to suffer because we've done something wrong. Yeah, I agree with that, and I also think I think what troubles me a little bit in the language, because that's that's a in my mind, you can't argue with the fact that there that there is pain that comes from the sins of the fathers and mothers that are visited upon their great great grandchildren. For me, the question is: Did we create this pain that's passed on, or is God punishing my great great grandchildren for a sin that I've committed? And I, I want to back away from this being God's punishment, and instead it being the consequences of our bad moral judgment or you know our behavior. That has violated God's world, and and that's passed on to you. I, I would agree with that, and I take some comfort in the other side of that because it says that the sins of the fathers and the mothers, if you would, are passed on to the third and fourth generation, but the blessings that we create extend to the thousandth generation. Right. And I like to believe that the way we behave in the world, when we do good, it it redounds to the benefit of so many more generations than the evils that we do. Yeah, so in some sense hyperbole, uh, on both yes. sides maybe, Absolutely. and uh, yeah, good. All right, I want to close by simply inviting you to remember the commandment is about not only not misusing God's name, but the backside, the positive thou shalt, is let's live our lives in such a way as people of faith that we represent God's name and use God's name well, that when people see us, they might catch a glimpse of the God who is, who loves them. You may remember that in our first session at the very beginning, um, we talked about the fact that some of the commandments, many of us believe that we don't really have to worry about, we're fine. And others, maybe more. And I think for church people, um, it might be easy to think that this is not one that we have to worry about. And I think that it is. And I think for our whole society it is. So, we're going to look at that just a little bit closer as we go. What struck you most about Adam and the rabbi's discussion about what it means to violate the third commandment? Did anything jump out at you that you hadn't thought about before? You're talking about the, the generations that will be affected? That, that is something that really, we just like to skip over, isn't it? Yes, and we, and we may come back to that because there's a lot to be said there. Um, they did say that typically when you talk about the third commandment, people think what well, means don't cuss or don't swear or don't, you know. If you asked people when we were in school if to use curse words was a sin, what do you think most people would say? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Is it? No. Mm -hmm. um, is it a good thing to do? I don't think so. But if, you know, it's not a commandment. The commandment, of course, has to do with our respect for God. Um, I like the, the modern interpretation when they've gone back to the, to the wording about using God's name as if it's insignificant, if it doesn't really matter. And in vain, I think is, is kind of how that would be um, pointed out, that Adam says to us that um, the question we're supposed to be thinking about with this commandment is, am I a good representation of the name of God? Yet you know, we say, we're a child of God. Well, I want my own child to be a good reflection on her parents, right? Are we good reflections on being called children of God? And the second part is, have I reflected God's name well? And I would add, and can I do that even better? You know, can, can we do that better? Um, when, if you're willing to share, have you seen or experienced somebody representing God well? Can you speak to that? You probably think of well in lots of places and lots of ways. Just your attitude. Mm -hmm. Your daily attitude. You see people that have a very positive, loving attitude. 
I'm going to take out my mask so it might be a little bit easier mm -hmm. to hear. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yes. One of the first things we learn is God is love. If someone shows no sense of love or compassion, are they representing God very well? Probably not. This commandment invites us to consider um, how we use God's name and it being a reflection of our reverence and respect. And I couldn't help thinking about this. Have you ever had any communication or seen any communication from a devout Jew where they've used the word God? Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. How do they write it, Ted? G dash D. Mm -hmm. Or G O with a slash through it and D. Because they don't think they are. I want to say able, that's not the right word. They don't feel that they have the uh, right to use that holy name. I put that way over here, wouldn't you? When I look at what our society as a rule does. And I, I kind of like to be more like that. When I came back from Israel, I had some communications from our, our God over there. And anytime he used the name God, it was typed G O slash D. And for lack of a better word, I just like that. I thought that was a real sign of reverence. Now, could someone of the Jewish faith do that in writing and go right out the door and reflect something totally different? They could, couldn't they? Really? Yeah. yeah, they could. Um, I, I doubt that that happens a lot, but they could. Have you ever heard of a pastor, a priest, or... Um, Anyone in the church leadership role that, that teaches about how to speak toward God and about God and then goes out and uses language differently? No. Think that happens? Sure. A lot. Yeah, it does. Um, so, this whole idea of reverence and respect, or the lack of it, is um, what we're talking about. And do not take the name of the Lord in vain. And it doesn't have so much to do with profanity unless that profanity is mixed up with the use of God. What is OMG? Oh OMG. Oh my, oh my God. I don't know when that started. It hadn't been that long. But I was just kind of bowled over with that. And Part of me thinks it's nice that they text it OMG. And part of me is like, no, they just text everything uh, short, short, kind of like that. But if you had a, a, a child of a younger age than I think all of us have had, um, would you intervene if they were saying, oh my God, all the time? If I had a child, yeah, oh yeah. 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 Um, could you ever say, oh my God, and it'd be okay? I think so. I think you need to believe it. Yeah, yeah, if you are crying out to God yeah. in all sincerity, yes, it is a, a it's a reverent plea, um, and it would be perfectly okay. But it, but it is not the way it's being used at all. And uh, we have this conversation at our house a lot, especially with our forty-one-year-old child, and she certainly understands. There are so many movies that the stories are such that we would really like to watch them. And for lack of a better word, you know, I don't think that I'm a prude, um, but the language is so bad, particularly with God's name wrapped up in it, that it, it just, it keeps me from focusing on the story. It just ruins it for me. Um, and it just seems to me that that's such a norm these days. Um, in Adam's book, there's a section called Promise Keeping and Truth Telling, and, and he writes that many scholars have suggested that the primary intent of this co commandment has to do with the practice of square notes. You see, we always come back to that because all of this stuff, particularly in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, we have to remember the culture, the context, and so forth. There was a lot of squaring up oaths back in that day, and I think Adam touched on one of those, you know. Um, in our courts until recently, was that not part of testifying? We would you know, be asked to go hand on the Bible, and I swear, you know, for God. Um, 
Would it be okay to make that oath? As long as you live. As long as you live by. And, and sadly, and yet happily, I guess you could say, it was a good thing that our society used that because the general understanding would be nobody would make that oath and lie. Do you think that's true in the 21st century? I think, I think it's in some generations. I had a unique experience with that yeah. in court. I was uh, on a call for jury duty. And uh, so you're in a pool, and they select from the pool a number of people. But before they select anyone, everyone is sworn in. Man sitting next to me, and they didn't have enough Bibles, so we had to share Bibles. And so he and I are sharing a Bible. He said, well, it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference because I'm a Jew. And I said, well, that's okay. You take the Old Testament, and I'll take the New. <laughs> I swear before God. <laughs> Bless his heart. <laughs> yeah. Uh, interesting. Right. So I don't get the feeling that it's the oath as much as the fact that it may not be sincere. And uh, I, I agree with you, Ted. I do think that it makes us stop and think. Most people. Um, but others, I, I don't know so much about it. What kind of vows do we take these days? Oaths, vows. Do we still do any of that? Yeah, marriage vows. Yeah. 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 When we get married, we and that is a, a vow is an oath. I promise that I'm gonna do this. And we promise before God. God. Um is a handshake a type of a vow or an oath? Yeah, I I I think contracts and have been on a handshake. Mm -hmm. yeah. and it's, it just depends on the person that's doing it as to what how much it means. But if the understanding is that by us shaking our hands on this deal, or have we got a deal? Yes, shake. Mm -hmm. Then it is it is a contract. It is it's a verbal or a, a, a physical contract. And we have written contracts. And when we sign our names to those, we are kind of taking an oath, for lack of a better word. Um, and then there are promises. <laughs> oh, I promise I'll be fine before eleven. <laughs> a promise is a type of oath, also, isn't it? And uh, I think we've become much more glib about all of those things over time. So the the commandment really has a lot more um, packed in than I think we might realize. And that's good for us who think oh, I'm not going to take the name of the name of the Lord in vain. And uh, you know, many of us oh, church folk will say, oh my Lord. And I don't think that's necessarily bad, but if you just say it, just, and there is nothing behind it, um, then you're saying the Lord's name for no reason. Is that an easier way, it's an easier way for me to think about it. Am I saying God or the Lord or Jesus? Oh, Jesus. Well, what do I really mean? Oh my goodness, or oh my word, then, it, then that's that's a violation. And so you don't have to be one of these people in R and X or in movies to break to break this commandment. Um, we've we've considered a couple of applications of the third commandment. Jeannie, would you do us a favor and would you read Numbers uh, thirty verse two, and we're going to listen carefully to what you read. This is from Numbers 30, verse 2. Mm -hmm. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that was proceeded out of his mouth. That's in Numbers, and it goes on to kind of... Uh, extrapolate and expand what this commandment says. So, Jimmy, what do you think the verse is saying about the importance of a promise that we make? What's that verse? To me, if we make a promise, we have to keep it. Mm -hmm. or, or what if we say we do? Yeah. Yeah, it's saying that a promise is a vow, promise is, is a serious, and that we are to keep it. And, uh, I think that's something we all need to remember today. It's not so much that uh, 
You may not keep a promise, but when you promise, you need to realize that you have every expectation of keeping it. You're not just, you're not just saying it. And that you would take it very seriously if you broke the promise, that you would be uh, seeking forgiveness, just like with any other disobedience that uh, you may have. Um, well, once again, Jesus' teaching moves from the thou shalt not. Now, isn't that what we see in the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That's not so much the way that Jesus puts it. He tends to turn things around so this more positive ethic of how we're supposed to live our lives. And not because that way you're going to be obeying God, but that way you're going to enjoy the life God intended you to have. It's just going to be so much better. Ted, would you read Matthew 5, verses 33 through 37 for us? Again, you have heard that it was said uh, to the people a long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made in the, to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear it at all, either by heaven nor in God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his uh, footstool, or try, or, or by Jerusalem, uh, for it is the city uh, of the great king. And do not swear by uh, your head, for you cannot make even uh, one hair uh, while white or black. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no, no. Anything between that uh, becomes an evil. Yes, Ted, as you finish that, oh, that set of verses, I think that's where Jesus gets right to the heart of it. What is Jesus commanding us to do in those verses? Always speak the truth. Yeah. You don't have anything to worry about, do you? Be uh, people of integrity, honesty. I, I have my own take on that. Says, uh -huh. uh, tell the truth. It's too hard to keep up with your lies. <laughs> it's a lot more comfortable when you, you don't have, now did I tell the truth on that? Because if you always do. Um, remember when Ted read about Jesus saying, just, and, and remember, any time you see Matthew chapter 5, we're right in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. So he's preaching to us. He's telling us what to do. And he says, just let your answer be yes or no. Now think about it. If there are other people over the years that you've known, if they say to you, I will do that for you and I will do it on Friday at 2 o'clock, that that's absolutely all they'd have to say. And you would take it to the bank that unless they absolutely physically couldn't do it, that they would do what they said they would do. And there are other people that they could swear by heaven, by their mama's grave, by their cat, and, and you'd be up. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. And so when I read that, I always think that if you're a person of integrity and you're known, remember we talked about reflecting God, if you're known as someone who says what you mean and you follow through on it, that is all you have to say. That's all you have to say. Oh. Well, Hamilton says in his book, as God's people, we bear the name of God, and we can speak about God not only through our words, but through how we live our lives. Nah, so we're doing okay till we got to this part, right? And this is where a lot of uh, well-meaning Christians trying to follow uh, Christ mess up. Have you seen people misusing God's name with their words? I sure have. I'm not sure I understand completely. I, I, okay. Um, I, I don't want to get too political, but we've had such graphic examples the, the last little while, and I think that they could be applied to many other uh, era, era, eras of history or whatever. Um, if you say, uh, 
Joanne's the president of the residence council because God wants her to be the president of the residence council. Is that an appropriate use of God's name? Yeah. I think so. I don't. Could it be that God wanted her to be in that role? Yeah. Do I know that? Yeah. I can't know that. I can't know that. And suppose I like Joanne. Then I want people to get that impression, right? Oh, she's she's there because yeah, God knows she's the right one. What if I don't like Joanne? Well, you know, God would, would never have let her be in that role. This is just the devil at work. <laughs> Who do I think I am? I'm not, I'm not privy to that information. Am I? Have you seen a lot of that in the last couple of years or so? More than one. Way too much. Way too much. Um, and sadly, about people that are very embedded in the church, for lack of a better word. Um, just because we say God, God, or Lord, Lord, doesn't mean that we are being holy. You know, and it's, you have to think about that because those words are so holy that your first thought is, well, if we're talking about God, this must be a good thing. What about with their actions? How would you misuse God's name through the way you act? How would a person of God tend to act? Would you act the same way outside the chapel or the sanctuary that you act inside the chapel? Yes. If you do not, quote, believe in God, I'm not so sure I think there are many of those folks, but they say they are. If you do not believe in God and you don't pretend to worship God, you don't go to church, you've made it very clear that you don't even know God, he's not even a friend of mine, you know, um, then their actions would not be reflective of that. But if you're in church, and you're telling folks, oh, I go to Bible study four, four times a week, I read my Bible every night, I pray every night, and then you're out there using the Lord's name in vain, telling jokes that are insensitive of other people or profane and so forth. What is that saying about your God? You know? And so your actions could be where you show up. I mean, yeah, Joanne, where, you know, I mean, we don't want to start judging people or calling names at all, but we know that there are places that we have no business being as children of God, right? And yet sometimes that has happened. We've, we've seen, well, I think it's new, so I guess we can say it, but Jerry Falwell Jr., wasn't his picture all over because he was somewhere in a picture doing things that didn't look like what he should be doing. Now, we don't know, I don't know all the details, but... Uh, we have to guard against where we are and, and, and what we do. Um, I'd like to say I've never, ever done anything that was suspect in any way, but I'm, I'm sure I probably did. Um, when this happens, what effect does it have on those both outside and inside the church? Arthur, you know, a lot of people have left the church because it's of the hypocrisy. The church is just full of a bunch of hypocrites, are they right? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. That's what you should be. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, I'm glad that we're here in the church where there's there's hope for us. But some people look for excuses, don't they? Not to be involved in yes. religion. Yes. And if you don't need it. Yeah. So they say, well, look at her. She'd know better than me. Why should I bother to go to church? Yes. So that's people out there looking at us. You say, well, I don't... It's not my job to, to be a role model for them, really. We need to read our Bible again, don't we? Yes. Um, but then what about people on the inside of the church? How does it affect them? Similarly? We're in community. And I realize that. In some ways, we're a church here, and in some ways, we're not. But I think we've all been involved in regular congregations. But if you're just in a community of believers that you associate with, um, maybe you move into town and you become part of a congregation. And when you go to a fellowship dinner, um, there's alcohol. 
not not against alcohol, but maybe you know excessive alcohol. Um, maybe the behaviors are just not. You know what I'm saying? How would you feel about being part of that faith community? Oh boy, I've got a fun place. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Don't allow this. It must be right. Yeah. So well, this is not this is not what I thought my life was going to be like. And and then you have a choice to make, don't you? Am I going to just blend in with, with this body behavior or whatever? And say, well, they mean well, you know. And I've I've done some of that before. Or are you going to say, I need to find a faith group where I feel like I must say that? Yeah. We we belong to a golf group that uh, was. was a mixture of a lot of well, several different faiths and a lot of different uh, ideas, and uh, and and it was a it was a party group, and uh, but uh, it uh, but it was also a fun golf group. That's <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and and we enjoyed that part of it. Uh, um, but sometimes uh, uh, Brittany got uh, got out of hand. And uh, but yeah, we were a part of that. Um, didn't necessarily take part in it, but kind of rolled with the punches. And um, and so you know, we just knew that that's going to happen. But um, we, we had one one member that had a, a extensive brain surgery, so he was no and and he was. He was a healthy drinker in his day. But after the operation, he could no longer drink. And, and he said to Joan, he said, uh, this really gets boring, doesn't it? It's <laughs> <laughs> looked at work life on both sides. <laughs> so he, he, he was a part of it on one side, but then when he saw it on the other, um, it, it, it had an entirely different uh, concept. And, and and his feeling. Um, so, yeah. I know that. Yeah. I'm now, I think, the only one living out of the truth. We are not going to assume anything about God granting long lives. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah. It doesn't mean, though, in a group like that, that you're going to naturally uh, take on those behaviors yourself. But it, it can be, especially if it's a gathering for faith discussions, Bible studies, or whatever, that that may be that you're like, this is not, this is not what I feel like I'm supposed to be doing. We need to move along. This is this is really a very interesting conversation. Um, but again, Jesus' approach to keeping this commandment was not merely about avoiding profaning God's name, but by positively hallowing God's name. And that takes me back to the Jewish faith of not feeling worthy to use that name. And, uh, and just making it, and I think I can work on making it more hallowed in my day-to-day -day world. Um, it's just become so much a part of the common language, and, and, uh, and, and we need to try to, to reverse that. Um, Ted, would you be kind enough to read Matthew chapter 5, sorry, on Matt, verses 14 through 16? You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bushel. Instead, they, they put it on a stand and it is, uh, gives light uh, to everyone uh, in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they uh, can see the good deeds, and praise uh, your Father in heaven. Does that make it pretty clear how the disciple is to live? Yes. I, I think you know, people can, can see the way you are and, uh, and what you portray. Um, I, I had a, a, a boss that uh, uh, every... Every sentence seemed to have a bad language in it, uh, and um, and it just seemed as though it set a, a tone uh, for the entire organization. And and I, you know, 
uh, I spent time in the army, so you know I understand the language. Yeah. So, but it, uh, but I found found it offensive, and when I was in a position then uh, to be an authority, uh, I made it a point that I never uh, used any type of profanity, and um, you know, to, I, I don't know that I did today. I try not to, and um, but uh, I just I think the, the, what you portray. Uh, to the people that are around you, uh, sets the tone for that, that group. It's kind of like lowering the bar. Well, if this is the standard for an organization, and you lower the bar of the leadership, then everything else kind of, it may not get to that level, but it still um, changes the tone, as you're saying. Well, during this brief study of this third commandment, have you realized any ways in which you may have misrepresented God in your words or your actions? You don't have to confess out loud, but um, you know it's it's Not very easy. It's very easy to do. You think God's calling you to make amends to someone in this area of your life? Your boss, for example, if he were sitting here, I would want him to be thinking. You know, if I could, I'd like to go back to some of those facts and say that I now realize that that was not the way I was to live my life, and. Um, we each are in different places, and so we have to think in terms of, have we uh, been a stumbling block to someone else? Because if someone looks up to you, you know, um, I think of Marion Simpson. She's been just like a mentor and just a saint to me for so many years. And if I heard Marion Simpson say something um, vulgar or act in an unlikely -like way, first of all, it would break my heart. But then you may go, well, she's such a saint. If it's okay for her, maybe I am a freak. You know, uh, we'd never want to do that. I try to be very careful in my sermons because I know that very often from the benefit of having a lot of study or from the benefit of just having my own opinions, um, I don't want to share those if it may be a stumbling block for people who are in a different place in their understanding of, of the scripture. So the same thing is, is how we may uh, represent something having to do with God. In what areas of your life is the Lord calling you to grow in love in your words and in your interactions with others? This is the heart of it. I think we can love one another, but I think we, we need action too, to, to step in here and do something, even if it's a phone call or just a little something yeah. to show people that you really do love them. We started out talking about God is love, and we're talking about reflecting God. Do we have to use God's name at all, good or bad? No. We can just simply act with compassion, right, and care. Yeah. Um, have you ever known any people that you might consider mean-hearted that are pillars of your church? I have, I have. And they are probably good people, not realizing that they're projecting that non caring or, you know, hostile. We don't know anything about your boss's faith beliefs, do we? No. But he sure wasn't projecting them, was he? Yeah. He's not the first person you probably would go to to pour your heart out to, them, that sort of thing. Well, we need to move on to commandment four. And in commandment four, our goals are going to be to learn about God's intentions for the Sabbath, consider what it means to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, and reflect on Jesus' interpretation of the Sabbath, and consider how to reclaim it in our lives. I just want to start at the end and reclaim it in our lives. Has the Sabbath gotten away from us? Mm -hmm. A little bit, huh? Hmm? Yeah. And just because we're on lockdown here doesn't mean that everybody's really, you know, remembering the Sabbath to keep it holy. So we're going to consider what that means. And um, we're going to start by listening to what Adam wants to share with us about this. And I have a feeling there's a lot of rich discussion to be had about where we are in our society and where we are in our individual lives. So let's listen to Adam. <laughs> So we come today to the fourth commandment in which God commands us to honor the Sabbath, to remember the Sabbath day, and to treat it as holy. 
And as we're going to learn in the chapter, that has to do with both rest for us, but also renewing and reconnecting in our faith in God. So I'd ask you, what do you do when you renew? Where do you go? What are the places that you like to be that just calm your heart or soothe your soul or allow you to recreate, to recreate? And for me, it's always water. And I think about the Lake of the Ozarks. It's about two and a half hours from my house in central Missouri. And when I go there, I love to get on a boat. I love to be on a paddle boat with my granddaughter. I love to just sit on the dock. And it is renewing for me. Well, for the ancient Egyptians, and maybe for the Israelites as well, part of that came through being on the Nile River. The Nile River was a central part of life in ancient Egypt. It was the source of life. It sustained life there. And I thought you might enjoy, again, because I want to take you to these places that tie into this story, I thought you might enjoy going to the Nile and just experience what you would experience if you were, if you were taking a journey down the Nile River. So let's head to Egypt. And let's take a journey down the Nile. you have a chance to experience it one day on your own. It was a remarkable experience to take a, a boat down the Nile River to experience and to see what Moses had to have seen many times as he was traveling between cities when he lived in Waset or Thebes or Luxor. So we want to focus on the commandment to honor the Sabbath, to remember the Sabbath, and to keep it holy. And in this, I find that Christians do a really lousy job of remembering the Sabbath day, of honoring it in the way that God intended. And the people that I think do it the best are my Jewish friends. And so once more, we return to our conversation with Rabbi Ardenatov. Let's take a listen to what he has to say about the Sabbath. The Sabbath is central to who we are as Jews. We operate our entire calendar around Shabbat. We work for the week, waiting for Shabbat to, to come, and then we sadly say goodbye to it. It is a time of renewal, a time of rest, but more importantly, it's a time of imitation of God. It says in the book of Genesis that after six days, God then rested on the seventh. When I rest on Shabbat, I'm regenerating myself. I'm regenerating that soul that God has given me so that I can go out and do good in the world just as God does good in the world. So what does, uh, what does Shabbat look like in terms of practice for, for you and your family and for the members of your community? For me personally, uh, Shabbat includes uh, services with our community on Friday night. Shabbat begins on Friday evening at sundown. It continues till Saturday evening at sundown because it says in the book of Genesis, there was evening and there was morning the first day. So to our days begin in the evening and continue through the day. It begins with services in the evening and then it continues with a Sabbath meal with my family. And then Shabbat afternoon is a time to rest and relax. In a traditional world, it would be uh, visiting with friends and family, no electronics, no driving would all be very natural and doing no work of any kind. I interpret a little bit more liberally, so for me, Shabbat will include a bike ride. Shabbat will include gardening with my wife at our house. Uh, Shabbat will include perhaps going to a movie together, because I never have a chance to go to a movie. It's a time for me to do that which is relaxing and nourishing. It's definitely a time for family and friends. If we could, some of us would be on our phones and we'd be working 24-7. There is no longer that sense of walking out the door and turning the key and you have a different life. It's all been blended together. Shabbat is an opportunity to say, stop. Don't do that. You need to have this time for yourself to regenerate your soul, to regenerate your family. And that's what the gift of Shabbat is for us. Yeah. What I love about Shabbat is we don't ask God to do anything on Shabbat, on the Sabbath. We, with one exception, we ask for peace. We praise God for what we have in the world. So we allow God to rest exactly. on the seventh day just exactly. as we do. That's wonderful. For many of our people who visited the Holy Land, and you get to the Holy Land and you find uh, elevators, the buttons are all pushed, you're going to stop on every floor. For Christians, sometimes it's it seems like like taking the commandment to a degree that feels almost 
absurd. And so explain that. Help us understand why that's not the case and, and what the what's beautiful or, or good about that. If God says to you, jump, what do you ask? How high? But you don't just ask how high. You ask when, how often, where, what direction. You, there are a hundred questions you ask. Because if, in fact, God is your God and you have this intimate relationship and you want to please God, you want to do things exactly the way that God wants you to do it. And so if God says to me, do not work on the Sabbath, I want to know exactly what it is that God is expecting of me. What it, constitutes work. Exactly. And so if work constitutes creating something or changing status, every time I push a button on an elevator, I'm creating a circuit. I'm creating something. And while it may not feel like work to us, it is the intent behind the prohibition. And so in order to be as true to God as one possibly can be, one goes to as many extremes as one can. And I don't mean that in a negative sense. It's the notion in, our, in Judaism of building a fence around the Torah, that you don't want to violate the laws. You, you want to honor God in the, in the best way possible. And therefore, you build this fence so that you don't even accidentally violate those principles that you continue to stay true to God. In liberal Judaism, it's a little bit different. Um, I don't particularly feel I am doing work when I'm pushing a button, but from a traditional perspective, it's very powerful. And it creates, by the way, um, a humility and a carefulness in life that I think is very valuable for all of us. Mm. So, um, one last question on this. I think many people would be curious about how does the Friday evening service differ from the Saturday morning service and do people attend both or are there different people who attend each of those? I'd like them to attend both. <laughs> Friday, night, <laughs> Friday night services are called in our tradition Kabbalat Shabbat, literally receiving Shabbat. And it is a joyful, often song-filled service that has a series of psalms that uh, celebrate God and celebrate God's God goodness and it is bringing joy and welcoming to the Sabbath bride. We, we view Shabbat as a bride and we are the groom. It comes from a poem in the 15th century um, and that poem is called L'Chadodi and it imagines Shabbat to Sabbath to be a bride we welcome the set, that bride into our lives. And think about um, whenever you see a bride come into a room, uh, it's a moment of joy, a moment of beauty, and that's what we're welcoming into our lives. And it's a very brief service. It has a traditional structure, but it begins with this welcoming of Sabbath. Saturday morning, which is a more relaxed time because we're not at work, it's a longer service. Again, we don't ask God for changes. We ask God, we praise God for what God gives us, but we also study Torah. And so unlike Friday night, we take out the Torah scroll, which contains those five books of Moses, and we read from it. And we also read what's called the Haftarah, which is one of the prophets, a lesson of prophets that has the same theme as the section of Torah that we read that particular Saturday. And then often there is a sermon, a drasha, um, explanation, uh, inspirational message that is offered on, on the sap, on, on, on that Torah portion for the week. And that takes place on Shabbat morning. Okay. So we return once more to the commandment. Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. To remember it means to observe it. It means to take rest. It means to do the things that renew us and recreate us. This is a gift from God. But I don't want you to forget the last part. Treat it as holy. To treat something as holy is to treat it as belonging to God. And so this day is a gift from God, it belongs to God. And in the midst of treating it as holy, we spend time with God. We pray, we worship, we read scripture. I want you to make that a holy rhythm in your life because it's in that time of worship, prayer, scripture study, listening for God's voice, being filled with God's spirit, that we find our soul renewed. May you be blessed by observing the Sabbath, by remembering the Sabbath day and treating it as holy.
I was sharing about the role of the Sabbath as a central factor in the lives of Jewish people. Are there any Jewish people who do not uh, treat the Sabbath the way the rabbi just described? Sure. Yes. Um, so what we're seeing is, um, for the most part, the way a devout Jew would handle the, the Sabbath. Just as we are going to try to look at how um, a true Christian would observe the Lord's Day, um, which we also call the Sabbath. But if we look at the Islamic faith, um, there's so much wonderful um, tradition and practice, and yet so few of people that are born into the Muslim community actually practice it. And so you see somebody, well, that's a Jew, and they're doing da-da-da-da. They're not a practicing Jew. You see a, an Islamic person doing something that wouldn't say violence. It's not the religion, it's the person who's choosing. Um, I mean, you know, if you go to a prison, I've said this a hundred times, if you go to a prison and do a survey and ask everybody in a prison, what is the faith they most identify with? What percentage would say Christian? I didn't understand the question. What's the... If thing you were to say? ask everybody in prison, what? what faith they most identify with? Oh. They would say Christian. Okay. What? Yeah. Christian, they wouldn't say atheist. And I don't know how many of them would say other religions. There'd be some. But the vast majority would say they're Christian. Does that mean that they go to church? Does it mean they, no, it just that's the faith they identify with. So we need to understand the practice would apply to those who are observing it and trying their best. So, Joanne, how would uh, you like to read Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11? Okay. It says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. One of the things that I think is very interesting is again we always forget, or we tend to forget, the, the setting in which our scriptures were taught and read, uh, done orally and then committed to writing, um, we live in a time when almost anyone who's employed has a day off, right? Um, there are, it's not unusual nowadays for most working people to have two days off. What was it like for the Israelites when Moses received the Ten Commandments? When they were in Egypt, how many days off did they get? They did none. Time off was the few hours you slept, you know? So it would be a little bit different for them, wouldn't it? Um, when we look at the ancient world, you know, there was no evidence that they had any required day of rest. They slept a little bit and they started all over again. Work was limited only by sunlight. As long as the sunlight was out, they were expected to be working. So the story of God's liberation of the Israelites from Egypt kind of begins with God's concern that that was too harsh. I mean, he had said from Scripture, six days. Whatever six days means in God's time, and the seventh day, rest. And so he was concerned about their labor, and so to it, he was insisting that the Israelites keep the Sabbath, keep that one day, and that they grant the Sabbath, um, that for them, their laborers, their animals, Anybody, everybody was to shut down on the Sabbath. Um, consider the working conditions of the Israelites. If you could sort of try to put yourself in those shoes, how would you react to being told that you are that you were to take a day of rest and not work? It'd be, it'd be really great. Heaven come down to earth, right? Yeah. Would you think many of the Israelites would have argued about that? 
You're going to have to sit in in the synagogue all day and listen to sermons and read the Bible. Still be a good deal, wouldn't it? Still be a good deal. So it's a little bit harder for us because as children and we know as adults, especially if we know people around us, that the idea of not doing anything on Sunday that wouldn't be considered to glorify God would be like, you got to be kidding. Not because they don't want to glorify God, but it just gets in the way of their golf game or the, you know, whatever they've got to do. And uh, so we need to remember that this was a blessing, not a curse. And uh, I'm not going to sit here and confess to how I have misused the Sabbath for the majority of my adult life. And uh, I know that it's, that it's wrong. I do know that. I am doing a better job than I've ever done before uh, to not work on Sunday. But uh, it's not a punishment. It is not a punishment. How important over time, because we've all been on the planet a while, how important has the Sabbath been in your lives? It's changed dramatically. Uh, and if we go back a few additional generations, um, the world was 600 like 100 years ago. Uh, we really did. Uh, we were more religious, uh, and we really did observe uh, the Sabbath. Um, my, my father was, uh, uh, it was, he was adamant about it. Uh, do nothing. And uh, uh, he went to church, uh, and we would go out to eat after church. Um, that was the extent of it. Uh, uh, he would not, he would go out and work on the garden or uh, uh, any other project that he had. Um, neither could we go to a movie. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there's no movies on Sunday. And uh, um, no games and chance. Uh, um, we never had dice in the house. <laughs> so, it, uh, um, things have changed. You know, we've, we've gotten uh, so that we accept so many things. Um, I shudder to think what another 50 years will bring. True, true enough, but I think we do look at it a little bit differently at our age, and probably the age of most folks that will be uh, participating with us on TV, that we've seen it probably in at least three or four different phases, for lack of a better word. Um, I know you all are not from the South originally, but you know we had blue laws here. Um, if, if, if my dad had gone up to mow the grass on Sunday, it wouldn't have been a matter between him and his Lord. It would have been a matter between him and the neighbors. Yeah. Wash your car. So when you refrained from doing those things, was it because you were holy or was it because you didn't want to be ostracized? Well, we won't get into that, that today. But um, just like Ted was saying, um, we went to church in the morning and went back to church at night. We had a nice lunch. And in the afternoon, we now slightly younger than Ted, just a little bit. And we could watch television in the afternoon. Well, back then, television was lame. It was safe, you know, so we could watch. Yeah. I think every Sunday, just about, we would watch Shirley Temple movies or something like that. But um, not so much now. When it became, um, when stores opened, first it was they weren't open at all on Sunday. I don't know if y'all experienced that. But down here, no stores open on Sunday. Well, then we got real liberal. And they could open after 12, I think it was 1, when the church services were open. And then it went to, well, you know, and they were open all the time. And it almost seems that as we have had more options on Sunday, we found more excuses to not just rest. Yeah. And you, uh, you know they didn't used to have church services on Saturday night. And that was uh, came about, I believe, because people had conflicts yes. in their activities yes. on Sunday. They didn't want to ruin their Sunday with the services. I can remember, just like it was yesterday when we first uh, talked about those Saturday services at West Market. And in my mind, I shouldn't say it out loud, but in my mind it was like, well, that's all well and good. Another church service won't hurt you. But don't think that's a word worship. That doesn't count as true worship. That's just an extra service. <laughs> and, you know, goodness gracious. Um, we know that the Sabbath was a gift. 
We just talked about the fact that those Israelites would have had no trouble seeing it as a gift. We maybe forget that and have a little trouble with it. But we do believe, don't we, that God cares about us and wants life to be good? I'm not sure everybody believes that about God, but uh, I certainly believe that, that those of us here talking today do. And so if you know that whatever God intends for us is to be loving and kind and good, then we ought to see that that's the case with the Sabbath as well. And that kind of moves, moves us uh, a little bit toward looking at how Jesus reflected. Because the Sabbath isn't about just resting, although that's a good thing. It's about remembering, reflecting, celebrating God's work and the creation. You know, looking around and seeing that it's good and, and pondering God's deliverance and so forth and so on. Um, Joanne, how about reading Deuteronomy 5.15? Deuteronomy, which one? Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15. Oh, 15, okay. Yeah, I Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. The command goes on to tell us that we're to treat the Sabbath as if it is holy because it is holy and set apart for God. So can you think of any practical ways to set a day apart for God? We've, we've mentioned some. Do you have to be in church the whole time? No. Or I would probably say, do you get to be in church the whole time? My mother used to fuss at me. She said, Patricia, you don't have to go to church every time the door's are open. <laughs> and she was a good woman. She was a wonderful woman. Anyway. Um, but could you just sit in your recliner and relax and maybe think about all the good things that have come your way through God's grace? Think about people that, uh, you know, you might want to do something for in the, in the future. Um, would it be a violation? to take a pie to someone down the street that's sick, no. or some soup. Because you're doing it in love. Exactly, exactly. That's certainly would glorify God. Well, in Exodus 31, verse 13, it says, be sure to keep my Sabbaths, because the Sabbath is a sign between me and you in every generation, so you will know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. Now, our Friend, Pastor Adam writes, so the Sabbath is a gift, and it's a rule to live by. But the challenge of rules, even good ones, is that we can get so focused on the rule that we end up missing its intent. And that's where I think we really come into the significance of this session of our study. If you look at what was happening with Jesus and when he was being criticized, was he breaking the law? You don't want to say Jesus did it there on me. <laughs> Was Jesus breaking the law? Yeah. Absolutely. If you looked at it the way the Israelites, the Jews, looked at it, because in their religion, there was no wiggle room. There was no wiggle room at all. No work meant no work. And you just heard Rabbi uh, men. Rimenov, Rimenov, I, I butchered his name, I'm so sorry. But we just heard him talk about that. The, um, there are many um, sects of Jews, if you will, Hasidic Jews and others, who take the Sabbath law to the uh, nth degree. Uh, anything that even remotely smacks of work, like he was talking about. You know, and if you take it all the way back, work is anytime you're moving something and putting a force to it. And so uh, it, it can really mean almost doing nothing. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. And then of course you have others who have become more liberal in their interpretations, just as Christians uh, have looked at that a little bit differently. But Jesus didn't say, I'm breaking the law because the Sabbath doesn't matter. It was a good Jewish boy, wasn't it? Where was he on, on, on Saturday? Where was he on the Sabbath? In the synagogue. In the synagogue, absolutely. And so um, what Jesus wasn't doing was trying to play down the Sabbath. But what he was trying to teach was, if in keeping the Sabbath, you are denying help to others, 
you're keeping yourself from being godly just so you can not. Now, I'm gonna let that I'm gonna let that dog lay there and go with that water and food because it would be work if I went over there to feed him. Then he's saying you're just you're destroying the whole meaning of the Sabbath. Uh, the Sabbath he routinely entered into was, the, was in the synagogue, as you said. But then he ministered and, and taught on the Sabbath. That's work. But it's good work. And it glorified his father. And presumably then he would rest in the evening with the disciples. Um, but he showed us that the Sabbath was made for whom? What does the Bible tell us the Sabbath was made for? Mm -hmm. Sabbath was made for man. And woman. <laughs> uh, but not. But you know, and we tend to think, well, the Sabbath was made for God. No. God gave us the Sabbath. Let me read Matthew. Um, I'm going to read to you out of Matthew, just a second here, of Matthew 12, oh, there it is, Matthew 12, verses 9 through 14. Jesus left that place and went to the synagogue. A man with a withered hand was there. Wanting to bring charges against Jesus, they asked, does the law allow a person to heal on the Sabbath? Jesus replied, who among you has a sheep that falls into a pit on the Sabbath? and will not take hold of it and pull it out. How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? So the law allows a person to do what is good on the Sabbath. Then Jesus said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he did, and it was made healthy, just like the other one. The Pharisees went out and met in order to find a way to destroy Jesus. And then we look over at Mark 2, verse 27, then he said, the Sabbath was created for humans. Humans were not created for the Sabbath. This is why the human one is Lord, even on the Sabbath. And that, I think, is, is, the, is, the, is the key thing. The rubric, the, the rubric we can use is, I'm doing this on the Sabbath. Is it good? Am I doing good? And if you're Answer is yes, then that would be okay. So Jesus is removing all that nitpicking about the Sabbath. He's not doing away with the Sabbath. In fact, I would argue, I think many of you would argue, that he was making it richer. He was making it more valuable. Okay. Well, we've got so much to talk about. Um, it looks like here it's the spirit of the law, not the law. Letter of the law. Absolutely. Yes. So we that, that's what that the Sermon on the Mountain is so much about. Yes. Yes. Spirit of the law. Yes. Why are we doing it? Because if you, if you, some things, if you obey them, like things in the Bible, but your attitude in your heart is, well, then you haven't fulfilled the spirit of the law. Well, we're kind of getting closer to the end of, of this session. But this whole business of the Sabbath, uh, it, it, it's a great concern of mine, uh, with myself, with my family, and, and with our society. And I really think this is a valuable topic. Uh, even if we weren't studying the commandments, I think we could do a whole study almost on the Sabbath. And um, I will get the name later if you're interested. But Marva Dawn, that's it, it just came to me when I didn't have to remember it. Marva Dawn wrote a book called Keeping the Sabbath holy, but she spells holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, completely. And it's a wonderful book. Um, and I would recommend it to you if you're interested in that sort of thing. But um, it's almost like talking about being in groups where people are behaving badly, and you just don't know how to take a stand with that, or if you should, and, and then things just evolve. Um, I don't know how we how we reconsider the Sabbath. Would you say that there's no way to take it back, that it just is what it is, and we just have to do what we can do? Or could our society ever reverse the trend? I think we could. And I think it has in many in many areas. Uh, we look at the, some of the gatherings now in the. In the um, the new churches uh, uh, with uh, the, the 
string instruments and drums and, and what have you. But uh, uh, that is, it, it draws a big uh, group. And uh, it's become a good, it's become a big part of, uh, uh, I think, all religions. Uh, we saw it uh, uh, there with the, the Jewish religion. Uh, Friday night they had the, the bands and, and so forth. So, um, and you know, the church that we belong to in, in Wilmington. We had the, the, the traditional services at 8.30 and 11. We had the contemporary service at 9.30. And, uh, and so each of those groups uh, were, it was basically the same service, but it uh, um, had a little different configuration to it. Okay. So Ted's talking about the fact that our society may be doing things to encourage folks to come to worship. But then there's the what do you do when worship's over? Yeah. Do you think if folks are drawn into worship services that it might guide them to have a more reflective thought about the rest of their day? I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. Um, they might do things that we might not think are right, but it's not up to us, you know. Um, but they probably would have, you know, more positive activities. Um, just because you don't do bad things on the Sabbath, I don't think means that you're honoring the Sabbath, do you? I don't think yeah. I did bad things on the Sabbath, but that doesn't mean I'm always honoring the Sabbath. So, yeah, if you just lay in bed and slept all day, um, it wouldn't be bad, but at some point that might not be honoring the Sabbath at all. Um, we're going to have to bring this to a close, and uh, I would like for you to think of four things that renewed you, that bring you joy, that you haven't done in a while. Think of something. It just, just makes you happy. Four things. And you don't have to share them. But I would like you at some point to write them down. And then, of course, I want you to think not in terms of COVID. Just pretend like COVID. Because I do believe there's going to be a morning after. <laughs> I hope I'm not wrong about that. We're getting but, there. Yes. And think in terms of, of what joyful activities that you could engage in again. And what, um, what you could do to preserve the Sabbath. Can we say no to things that are clearly not an observance of the Sabbath for us? We can. We can. Now, at my age, I don't feel that I have to fight that as much as I did. Would you agree? I thought I was yeah. we, we, <laughs> we're, not all, we're not always in the catbird seat, but you know, once you get over 75, you know, you probably let off the hook with some of that. <laughs> But we still do model for our grandchildren and grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren as to, uh, you know, what we do. But um, there are things that we could be invited to be a part of that we would just say, you know. And we don't have to get all holier than thou about it. Give them a sermon. We just say, I'm so sorry, but I just, just can't, can't do that. And uh, move on. Well, we're going to close in prayer. And... Um, I wish we had more time to discuss this, but I do hope this has been meaningful for you. To me, it's simply just the tip of the iceberg. And I'd love to think that folks out there with the Touchtown and, and those of us here in this group will continue to think about it and have conversations about both of these because I think we can see both keeping the Lord's name holy and keeping the Sabbath holy as things that there might be a whole lot more to than we have given thought. Um, and I'm going to certainly pray that the Lord will guide me to do that. So let's, let's pray. Lord God, we praise and revere your name. And we just pray that you would help us to honor you in, in everything that we say and all that we do. Help us to realize that we are truly the only hands and feet that you have in this world. And our words, our thoughts, and deeds help us to bring glory to your name. We thank you for the gift of the Sabbath, uh, the gift that helps us to see that you care for us, and that care extends to all parts of our lives. And then we pray that we would follow your plan for our lives. And as always, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, next week, we are going to do one commandment. And before you think, oh, that would be a lot easier, we're going to do the fifth commandment, and uh, there might be an awful lot there, so let's be sure and read that chapter. We will gather here 
and uh, we will video for our folks that can participate online. Thank you. Goodbye.